Good day, Brutal Planet listeners. This is Eric Peterson, quarantining from Salt Lake City. And today is my distinct honor to be joined by Mr. Fee Waybell of The Tubes. How are you doing today, Fee? I'm pretty good. I'm still quarantined. <laughs> where are you quarantining from? No, no, I mean, I'm not, I'm not actually Well, I mean, where are you changed. hunkered down at? I live in Los Angeles. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I live in Los Angeles, and I am... Uh, we live on kind of in the hills, my wife and I, and we're, you know, being safe and wearing masks and, you know, gosh. Actually, we just went, they just opened up uh, outdoor dining here in L.A. Oh. And uh, we, we went to dinner, was it last night? Yeah, last night we went to dinner in the first time at a restaurant outdoors, and it was really cold. Uh, gosh, in like a year? I mean, oh. that had to have been a really re- weird feeling. <laughs> it was weird. And, we're, you know, we're sitting on the sidewalk uh, outside a little sushi bar on Santa Monica Boulevard. But, uh, and it was cold. You know, it was about 50. Of course, that's not that cold. But uh, but it was cool. It was cool. Yeah. And every, I guess, you know, it's starting to... Uh, it's starting to turn around, you know, the yeah. curve is starting to turn around and it it's, is. I'm pretty excited about that, that, you know, it's, the cases are getting less and less and less. And, uh, so yeah, it is, it's a good way. sign. It's a good sign. And in hopes that someday we will have live shows again, boy, I hope so. <laughs> Man, I really hope so. I am. It's the la it's been, Gosh, I think the last show we did was a year ago, January, January something. We played back east. We played the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. Wow. And, uh, and another theater in uh, in upstate Illinois. Uh, and that was like January 20th or something like that. Okay. Of, of That was the last gig we did. Man. Wow. Well, we're here to talk about your uh, latest release, which is semi-new still. It's a free uh, Fee Wable Rides Again. And before I start, I wanted to say I'm a big fan of the tubes. I was introduced to the fan, uh, the tubes in the, by MTV back in the 80s from uh, She's a Beauty. After that, oh, yeah. after that, I went back and discovered your older stuff. And I was fortunate enough to have an uncle who was a little older than me. And he had been a fan of yours for longer than that. And he talked, we talked just before this interview, and he wanted me to ask you a question. And so in his honor, I'd like to ask you, where did you guys come up with the name The Tubes, and how did you come about that name? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, well, at, uh, we, ha- we, uh, we had just moved to San Francisco, and we uh the two, the our band mm-hmm. and uh and actually uh we were uh we we had combined with another band we were two bands from from phoenix arizona mm-hmm. that that came to san francisco and uh we had combined the band so at the time that we had two drummers two guitar players uh singer keyboards bass and we were called the beans because that was that was Bill Spooner's band, and okay. his band was called the Beans, and we were and we were the Beans, and uh, uh, and we were playing around San Francisco, and uh, another band, and we had no product, we had no album, we had no record deal, but and a and a band from New Jersey came out with an album called the Beans, uh. and and we saw this, and we oh. That's our, you know, we were so indignant. We, that's our name. Man, <laughs> we're the beans. No, we're the beans. And I, uh, I, I remember actually calling up the record company. I'm trying to remember what record company it was, Atlantic or something, uh, that the that the album was on. And I said, man, we're out. we're the beans. Not, and and I talked to somebody on the phone, and they said, well, have you published? And I went, well, no. <laughs> they went, well, whoever, whoever publishes first gets the name. So, you know, tough, tough. That's tough. Okay, for you. And so we, got, we sat around with all the guys in the band. And 
we said, well, okay, let's everybody come up with 10 names and we're going to, you know, we had all these, the gas men and, uh, Suffer for Sound and Larry and Mary and uh, all these names and put them all put them on it, write them down on a piece of paper and put them all in a hat and then we're going to let our dog pick the name because we couldn't decide and we had been back and forth and back and forth and no everybody you know couldn't decide on what name so uh, uh, <laughs> uh our dog's name was Sandwich, and <laughs> and Mike Mike Cotton, the synthesizer player, he had he one of his names was Tubes, Rods, and Bulbs, <laughs> and Tubes, Rod, Tubes, Rods, and Bulbs are different kinds of cells in the eyeball. Yep, yep. and. And Mike thought that was a good name. And so what he did was he put a little smear of mayonnaise on the piece of paper that had his name on it. And sure, sure enough, Sandwich picked out that name. And uh, uh, and we went, wow, two draws and bolts. Well, and then we thought, uh, you know, we sat around, well, okay, well, that's kind of a tongue twister. And, uh, and also... You know, it's good. They're going to end up shortening it to like TRB or something. Yeah. And uh, so, what if we just make it tubes? We'll forget the rods and bulbs. Too many consonants. And uh, so that was it. So we picked the tubes, and, and we thought, well, how appropriate. You know, we're doing visuals. We're a very visual band yes. doing theatrics along with the music. So, how appropriate to 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 choose. Uh, a cell of the eyeball. So yeah, that's very go. good. So, so my other question for you is too, is when we were talking, I, we, we were from your solo work to a lot of the, your work with the tubes, you have a very sarcastic way of delivering your art. It is, <laughs> in yeah. fact, in fact, we were, when we were talking, we were saying it's almost like a weird Al Yankovic without remaking a song. You know, it's it's very sarcastic in that way. Would you agree with that assessment? And, and what about this way of looking at life, life's influences, your music? Well, uh, I guess, I guess, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it certainly can be described as sarcasm, for sure. And I think that, uh, I think the roots of that came from uh, our our childhood growing up in, in Arizona, in Phoenix, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Phoenix, Arizona, you know, besides it being sweltering, you know, most of the year, uh, uh, so, uh, so a lot of the time, you know, you're indoors yeah. watching television. Yeah. And, uh, which, which is also interesting because the, you know, the TV was nicknamed the boob tube. Yep. And, uh, so, uh, so all of us, you know, we all sat around watching television all day and we watched, I used to love those old, you know, Westerns on TV, the Virginian and mm -hmm. the Rifleman and, you know, uh, uh, Wanted Dead or, Dead or Alive with Steve McQueen. Yeah. And, uh. Uh, gun smoke. So we we gun smoke really, yeah. and uh, so we watch TV all day long, pretty much. And uh, the thing about Arizona was, uh, it was it was, I mean, marketing companies kind of figured that Arizona was not influenced by the East or the West. It was kind of a an isolated market where they could test <laughs> stuff. And you know, not in, influenced really by Chicago or by by California, mm -hmm. and because uh, it's out in the middle of the desert. So they would test. We were we were guinea pigs. They would test every fast food was originally tested in Arizona. Drive through fast food, you know, Jack in the Box and McDonald's. I think one of the very first McDonald's was in Arizona, and uh, they used to test 
all kinds of stuff on us. And like, like one of the tests were these uh, trampoline parks. They would, you know, and, and everything was completely spread out. You know, it's a one, it's a one level city. Phoenix, yeah. For the most part, or at least it was back then. So we had these giant malls. They were just huge. And there's just parking lots were just vast stretches of asphalt. And uh, so in one of them, they decided to try this uh, trampoline city <laughs> where they would cut a, cut a hole in the asphalt about three feet deep, you know, and about, I don't know, 10 by 10. 12 or something like that. And they stretched a, tam a trampoline across it. And then, you know, with springs and everything tied down on the sides. Mm -hmm. And, but, but, but that's it right in the middle of the asphalt. So, th so then they're selling tickets to people to come and jump on the trampolines. They went, Oh, that's so great. And everything, except that, that the surrounding perimeter was asphalt. <laughs> so you, you, nobody knew what, how to trampoline. Yeah. And so you're jumping on the trampoline, and the next thing you know, you're flying off head first onto the asphalt. And so that was a total disaster. They just, you know, they got sued every 10 minutes. Yeah. And, uh, and then another one was, uh, and, well, they still actually have modified this, but they, they called it super slide. So it was a big... It was a big, like, plastic ramp that was about, you know, like 50 feet tall. And it was a plastic ramp that had, like, you know, like a like slalom in it. It was, mm -hmm. it was like a roller coaster, like a, you know, up and down and up and down and up and down. And you slide down it all the way to the bottom. And same thing, you know, not no water on it. But they, you'd climb up these stairs all the way to the top, and they would give you a burlap bag. Ah, yes. And you'd sit on the burlap bag. Some kid wearing shorts would sit on the burlap bag, <laughs> and then you, they'd push you off, and you slide all the way down, and, you know, halfway down the ramp, the bag slips out from underneath you, and you, you, you burn, you know, you rip your flesh off on the friction of the plastic ramp and you come down at the bottom bloody and oh god so there's a lot of reasons to be sarcastic in in phoenix exactly and the sarcasm was was you know developed i think over the years and uh uh you know it just became a you know became a part of our persona i guess sarcasm and you i try to i try not to be so sarcastic anymore on it uh although a couple of the songs you know on the record uh man of the world is pretty sarcastic yeah and uh and promise Land is Land. also pretty sarcastic and, and you uh, know and in meant to meant to be alone is one of my favorite songs and that's it's got a little bit of sarcasm in it i love the words yeah. of the song you know yeah yeah, that too. Yeah, kind of hard to get away from, I guess. Yeah. So I've been trying to be more positive, especially with the situation. Yeah, you know, it's hard to be it's hard to be sarcastic about a pandemic that's killing hundreds of thousands of people. True. So, oh, True. so, so listening to you guys, I wanted to get an idea of who some of your early influences were. I mean, I I feel like. Maybe some Frank Zappa was had to have been in there, but I'm not. And oh then, yeah, and then oh what, yeah, and then some of your stage show was it was I mean your a fellow native uh, Alice Cooper. I mean you, some of that stuff was that mixed in there too. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean it, it's funny we used to we would never admit that you know that we were influenced by Alice, and he would never admit that he was influenced by us. Yeah, and we always used to think that you know, he would send spies <laughs> to our show to steal our ideas. And then he thought we sent spies to his shows to steal his ideas. That's great. And, uh, and it's funny because, you know, we're best of friends. And, you know, I've, I've been friends with Alice for years and years. We played with him a hundred times, easy, because obviously some promoters going, oh, well, they're the two biggest theatrical bands there yeah. ever was. Well, let's put them together. And uh, he's got a, uh, he still lives in Phoenix, and mm -hmm. he has a uh, 
a charitable foundation called the Rock Solid Foundation, and I always go back to help him raise money. It's for like an after school, uh, an after school program that teaches kids music oh, and yeah. dance and art. Yeah, and 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 it's completely free, and uh, and it's done really well, and it's, he's really helped. Every year we do a, a golf tournament, of course. It's, not not anymore. Yeah, we do a golf tournament with uh, celebrity golf tournament, and, and and have people come in and donate money to play with the celebrities. And then every year he does a Christmas Christmas pudding. It's yes, called. he does yes. a Christmas show. And uh, so yeah, uh, uh, I think I think in the early days more Captain Beefheart was a very very uh, influential. Uh, artist in our estimation. Okay. Uh, Captain Beefheart, we loved his early stuff, and and uh, we actually, you know, uh, we actually covered one of his songs, uh, My Head is My Only House Unless It Rains, on the third album, and we had him play. We had, he lived in, he lived, he lived in Lancaster, which is like a, outside LA here, mm -hmm. and we were in the LA, in the studio in LA, and asked him to come and play his, soprano sax on on Kathy's clone and uh so we were always and, and Zappa you know I saw Zappa many times in the early days with the mothers of invention mm -hmm. and uh, uh and and you know I think you know it just Roger loves Jimi Hendrix we used to always play uh on our last live album we closed the show with third stone from the sun oh, okay. and uh Roger is a huge Hendrix fan, and and uh, you know, so it's it's uh, it's all kind of mixed in together there. Yeah. Well, conversely, you've influenced a lot of artists too. I'm just curious if you have a couple of people that have came up and thanked you for your influences, and you know, some of your bigger influences. Influence. Uh, actually, yeah. Uh, uh, it's not, it's not someone that is in the spotlight of the news anymore, but Marilyn Manson, yeah. uh, you know, said that to us and, uh, he's not doing all that well these days, I guess. And, uh, uh, uh what was I going to say? Um, well, there, there used to be a band called the Plasmatics. Remember yep. the Plasmatics? Wendy, Wendy Williams and the plan, Wendy Williams. Wendy Williams. Yep. Yeah. Wendy Williams loved me. <laughs> she was, she, in fact, she said, well, I'm, I'm stealing your chainsaw bit because I really <laughs> love it. So I'm going to do it. And, yeah. Okay. Wendy, go right ahead. No problem. But even like uh, people like uh, Dave Grohl, right? Well, I, uh, I'm, you know, the Foo Fighters are, are, uh, my, obviously my favorite band. They have a yeah. new record. Yeah. And, uh, Miracle at Midnight. And, uh, and I met him. I met Dave Grohl in a in a vintage clothing store years ago in on Ventura Boulevard in, in the Valley here. And he was in there buying. He, he was. They were. He and Jordan were going to go to an '80s party, and he was looking for parachute pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I was in there looking for some kind of costume for myself. I don't know for a tube show. And I saw him in there, and I had never met him. And I walked up to him, and I went, "Man." I, you know, told him who I was, and and you know, I said, "God, you're you're my favorite band, and you're my favorite singer." And uh, and so we became friends, and uh, you know, we hung out and went to a couple of his birthday parties, and uh, uh, and then he had me. He asked me. He said, "This the uh, uh, he did a song on the Wasting Line album called Miss the Misery." And he said, "This sounds like the tubes. I want you to come and sing background vocals nice. on this song nice. for me." And and I and he was doing the record with Mutt Lang, and uh, and and which was really cool because you know they did it they did it analog. Oh, okay. and, uh, I don't know if you knew, but he yeah, no computers. They had two two twenty four track tape machines linked together. They had forty eight tracks. It was just like the way we used to do it back in the old days, you know all analog on two inch tape and uh and taylor and i sang background vocals on that record and then he asked asked me to perform uh that that song 
at a gig here in L.A. at the nice. Forum, which I did, which was really cool. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, everybody, you know, it's funny because everybody influences everybody, I think. You yeah. Know, people, no, especially the bands that you like. You know, we always wanted to be weird like Beefheart and, and, uh, uh, and Zappa yeah. and, uh, and do complicated, you know, times and complicated arrangements. And, uh, and I think we kind of, in the early days, you know, before we even did our first record, we, we have a couple of archive albums you know, that were tapes before our first record deal, before A&M in 75. Okay. And there are some really weird songs on there, <laughs> really weird times. And, and uh, oh, God. And then, you know, then we started meeting producers who are going, well, you know, you can't really get away with playing 9-4, okay? That <laughs> just, you can't exactly sing along with that anymore. Yeah. And, okay, so we'll change it and, and then we met David Foster when we went to Capitol Records. And Foster was, you know, he's he's uh, he's totally, you know, he's a brilliant arranger, and he really straightened us out. You know, really made us work hard. And uh, I remember the first. I thought I was a pretty good singer, and I remember the first, and this is once again back in the days when there's no Pro Tools, there's no fix, there's no auto-tune, there's yeah. no fixing it uh, with the computer, and the first song I sang was Amnesia, and, you know, I thought I was a pretty good singer, and I went out there and I started singing it, and he goes, okay, okay, well, let's try it again. I mean, then let's try it again. I ended up spending, I think, three days of four to six hours a day trying to sing that song to his satisfaction. Wow. And, and I mean, I mean, you know, and that, that was, that was pretty much the way it was with everything, with every single track, you know, it's like the Mutt Lang stories you hear about Joe Elliott. And yeah. And Def Leppard yeah. records. And, you know, it, it took him a week to get one line right. Yep. So, uh, uh, and, which was kind of cool, you know. After all those stories, I got to work with Mutt Lang on the on the Foo Fighters record, and he's he was a pretty cool guy. He oh, was that pretty cool. yeah. So your latest album is uh, Fee Weibo Rides Again," and it came out last year, but it's still on heavy rotation on my playlist. Um, tell us a bit about that album. Uh, well, we. Uh, as you know, or maybe you don't, Richard Marks and I are best friends and have been for years and years. And yes, years. I knew that. And uh, Richard helped me do, uh, uh, you know, I've been writing lyrics with him for for other people and for his albums and for singing background vocal, vocals with him and he with us. And so we, we, we go way back. And uh, we... Uh, Richard helped me do my second solo album, uh, Don't Be Scared by These Hands, he produced and wrote with me. And then, you know, that was 97, 98. And then a couple of years after that, he went, you know, and we kept saying for the next 10 years, we're, oh, let's do another record. Yeah, okay, let's do another record. And, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and then he went on tour, then we went on tour, then, you know, it was just one thing after another. And, uh, finally, uh, it was, we, you know, he, he has three sons mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm the godfather to his three sons, Brandon, Lucas, and Jesse. Oh, are you really? I and, did not know that. Yeah. Oh, excellent. And, uh, uh, so we used to do, uh, we used to do a, a summer, uh, boys trip when the boys were young. We used to do a trip every summer, and we used to, we used to go to his his family had a a cabin up in northern Wisconsin in a little town called Manaqua. Okay, and we would drive up from Chicago. He lived outside Chicago, and we would drive up uh, to Manaqua with the boys, just Richard and I and the three boys, and uh, uh, and hang out for a week. And just to, you know, go fishing and go boating and go go-kart riding and, you know, eat 
eat chocolate and french fries and you know do all those things that their mother wouldn't let them do yeah and uh uh so we we, we did that year after year after year and every summer i planned to go you know and you know one one year we went to whitewater rafting in Go cody wyoming and oh, went wow. to rodeo and it was really fun and uh but then uh it was the summer of 2013, and the boys were all old. I mean, the, Brandon was like 22, and uh, Lucas was 20 or 19, and Jesse was, I don't know, 17, 16. And they, you know, we said, okay, let's go. To, and they kind of went, you know, we, we don't really care about fishing, okay? <laughs> we're pretty much not interested in, we're, we'd rather go to the movies and hang out with our girlfriend. Oh, Really? Uh, okay. And, you know, and I had our, <laughs> I said, well, you could have told me before I came. And, well, anyway, uh, Richard, so that was when we started. Richard said, let's go write a song. You know, let's try, let's, you know, we're here. We've been talking about this for 10 years. Let's do, a, let's start a record. Let's start a solo record for you. And uh, he had a studio there in his house. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, okay, let's do it. So we did. So we went into the studio and we wrote Faker. That was the first song. Yep. And, uh, you know, we, we demoed it and we kind of, uh, I did a vocal and, uh, uh, you know, we, and we, you know, we said, let's, you know, let's make it like really rock, you know, a real guitar oriented rock, which nobody did anymore. And, uh, so I went, okay, okay, good. So so we started, that's how we started. And then we, in the next, uh, gosh, I, I guess in the next year or so, kind of back and forth between here and Chicago, we did three more songs. We did uh, How Dare You, Promised Land, and Woulda, Shoulda, Coulda. Okay. So we, we did four songs and... Uh, in, in various states of completion, uh, we had four songs in the can, and then, and then everything kind of ground to a halt uh, in like 2016, 17. Richard's Richard got a divorce, and it was kind of it was you know not a very happy divorce, and yeah. he was unhappy, and the boys were unhappy, and and I was on tour with the Tubes, and. And, and then he ended up leaving Chicago and moving to here to California. And uh, so it, everything kind of got, you know, set aside for more important things. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and like I said, I, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to force the issue. I, I, I was, really busy working with the band and we had just signed with a new management company and we were live nation and we're out, you know, doing a ton of gigs. And, uh, so then in kind of, uh, uh, I guess it was, it was not last year. It was 2019, uh, early in the year, Richard, everything had kind of calmed down. You know, we, we, we weren't working in the winter of 2019 and, uh, too much. And he had, you know, had uh, kind of got back to normal. He, he met Daisy Fuentes and mm -hmm. he got married. And, and we, everybody was kind of happy again. Happy and, and normal and great. And he had just done a record and finished a record. And then, so he said, let's go back to work. And I said, okay, let's go. And we did. And so we went back to work and we worked on the four tunes that we already have. And, and then he said, okay, let's, let's, let's see what we, what else we can come up with. And, uh, we had a couple of songs. Uh, well, the, the, the say goodbye song was a song I had written for him and he never put it on a record. Oh, okay. And, and I always used to listen to it on my, iTunes library and I loved the song and I thought, oh, man, this song makes me cry. I, I want to do this song. It was okay. Well, fine. We'll, we'll re-record it with you. And so we did that. And then, uh, and then, uh, there was another song 
that he, Richard, Still You on the Inside was a song that Richard had written with Chad Kroger from Nickelback uh -huh. uh, with the intent of, of submitting it to the Daughtry album. Oh. And, uh, and, it did, and, they, and he didn't want to use it. He, he, never, he never used it. He never, I couldn't understand that. Yeah. I thought it was such a great song. And, you know, he sent me the demo with Chad singing at home, and, and I played it again and again and again and again and again. And so we're trying to find songs. I said, Richard, what, what about doing Still You on the Inside? He goes, well, you know, it's really high, and, you know, that Chad's vocal is really good. And I said, well, I know. I, I doubt if I could beat that, but I, I really like to try. I just love that song. And I know I didn't have anything to do with writing it, but I don't care. And so we did that. So I put a vocal on that, and I, you know, it's kind of a country song. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of liked that idea. And uh, uh, and then there was another song that we had written, had written but didn't remember. And uh, he sent me this track. He goes, I found this track. And he said, I can't remember. He said, I really like this. I can't remember what the title was or... Or, or have you written this? Did you write lyrics for it or what? Because I don't remember. I don't remember any of it. And I didn't remember any of it. And uh, he said, well, see if you can figure out, you know, what it is. And if you find, find lyrics, if you, if you wrote them. If not, write, write them. And I went, okay. So, uh, and, and, you know, he, he sends me... Uh, Usually he sends me uh, uh, a text where he's playing an acoustic, like the one song on the record, uh, uh, Don't Pull the Trigger, that has that little acoustic text intro. Oh, intro, chart. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that was a text that he sent me, and, and Elizabeth, my wife, heard that and went, man, that's so cool. You should put that at the beginning of the actual recorded track. And I went, yeah, but it's a text. He goes, I don't care. It's really, it's cute. So we, the guy that makes the record, Matt Proc, uh, you know, I sent it to Matt, and I asked Richard. He goes, yeah, I, okay. I, goes, I don't know if Matt could do that or not. And, and so I said, here it is. It's a text, and I want to put that on the beginning as the intro to the actual recording. And he figured out how to do it, and and which is that's really so. That song we wrote new. In, in 2019, okay. and then uh, and then the other song that we wrote new was uh, meant to be alone. Uh, the last song that was brand new, but he sent me this track and he says I can't remember this song, and so I I heard the I you know I I played it and I and it, on the track is like like we always do it's like a it's like a guitar, acoustic guitar with a a la la uh, vocal of a melody line, you know, and, uh, la, 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 whatever the melody is, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she said, see if you can, so, and so I started on my, on my laptop, I have a, fo a folder that has all the lyrics in it, you know, these, that, you know, that I've written in the last, I don't know, whatever, 10 years or something. And, uh, uh, and I couldn't remember what it could, and so I just started with A, and and I just, you know, I would play, the, I would have the track, and I'd play it, and then I'd look at the lyrics, and see if they fit into the line, the melody, the length of the melody line. Okay. You know what I mean? And uh, and I I did it A, and then B, and then C, and then D, and then I went all the way to the M's, <laughs> and finally on M. I got to Man of the World, uh -huh. and, and I went, and I played the track, and I went, Man of the World, oh, that's it, this is it, and that was the song, and uh, so that, so we went and recorded that one, uh, so, so we had nine songs, and we pretty much said, okay, well, that's good, let's, let's, you know, send them off to Matt to mix, and to master, and start working on a, on an album cover, you know, and of course, you know, the best artist I know 
is Prairie Prince. Okay. And so I sent, I told Prairie, you know, what I wanted to do. And I, told, I said, you know, I kind of want to put a pyramid and, a, you know, horses, pyramids, picture of me. And uh, <laughs> so Prairie, Prairie designed the album and, uh, and uh, we got it finished kind of uh, early in 2020. And I sent it off to the, to the manufacturer guy and I got a bunch of them printed up and, uh, and then the pandemic hit. Yeah. And I kind of went, Oh, and then, Oh no, do we really want to, you know, now what, you know, but then I thought about it and I went, you know, here, here the whole world is quarantined and what are they going to do? They've listened to everything they've got. They probably would like something new exactly. to listen to. And I think a lot of other artists kind of got the same idea. Let's put out a record because everybody is needs something new. Yep. And they're all sitting at home, you know, going stir crazy and wanting to hear new music. And so we said, okay, fine. So we just, we, we just went ahead and just, you know, put it out on Amazon and, you know, all the digital, uh, all the digital, digital media mm -hmm. and, did a press release and did the whole thing. Uh, and I, I, I'm amazed. I, I'm really proud of it. It's really, it's really a great record, I think. And, uh, and, I, and, and I got, you know, the vocals came out great. Yes. And, uh, a lot of people have commented on, you know, oh, you can still sing. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm lucky. I'm lucky in that respect yeah. because, uh, all those years, you know, that I toured with the tubes, it's funny, we, we, uh, I'm doing this book, uh, my, Elizabeth and I are doing like a book of my life and it's got all these reviews and all these pictures and all the stories and it's called Fee Wib, Fee Wabel's Guide to an Unknown Trail. And, uh, uh, and cause my mother kept all of these, but you know, boxes full of stuff, reviews yeah. and magazines and pictures. And, you know, so I have all this material that we've been going through. And, uh, 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 I looked at some of the, uh, the old itineraries from t touring back in the, okay. back in the day. And I mean, I mean, we used to do like 10 in a row, Yeah, you know, 10 nights in a row in different cities. And, and I'm singing, you know, 95% of the, the set. And how did I ever do 10 in a row without ruining my voice or getting notes or doing, you know, uh, doing, you know, substantial harm to my voice. And, uh, but you know what I used to do? I used to go to acupuncturists. Oh. If I would, if, if my voice got strained and we're coming into a city, I would find an acupuncturist. And I would go to acupuncture oh, okay. and and tell them, hey, I lost my voice. And they would stick needles right into your throat, oh, right into you. right into where, you know, right into between your vocal cords. Yeah. They stick the acupuncture needle. And then sometimes they would hook electricity to it. You know, they would do like a low voltage yeah. uh, charge to it. And it was amazing. It was incredible. And Every time, every time I did it, my voice came back every time. Wow. And I mean, I, I believed, you know, I think that had a lot to do with it, that I believed that it would work. Yeah. And, uh, so uh, you and, and you're, I was going to say you and Richard, I mean, I follow Richard Marks quite a bit. And so I, and I've shot his shows a number of times and stuff like that. And I know that between you two, you guys are two peas in a pod. So I'm just curious, uh, like what is a recording session like together with you two? Uh, well, I mean, like you say, we, we, we pretty much know we have a method, you know, we know what we're doing. And, yeah. uh, uh, of course, you know, with, with, with pro tools, it's a lot easier. Yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, we, he lets me warm up. I sing it, you know, I sing it three or four songs, three or four or five 
times through the song, and then he goes, "Okay, you know, you you warming up?" Like, yeah, I'm, I'm warming up, and 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 you know, I I you know, he knows me. Okay, he knows me. He knows my voice. He knows. Uh, what I can do, and he knows what I can't do. That's why when we did, he's when we did. Uh, I kind of surprised him because when we did "Still You" on the inside, the out chorus is like an octave higher. He goes, "You know, this is really high." I I, I had trouble. You know, Chad had trouble doing this when, when we did it because it's so high. And I said, "Well, I know, but I, <laughs> let me try. It. Just let me try it." Yeah. And I and I did it. I pulled off the the high part and. He was going, fuck, man, I can't believe it. And, uh, but, but he just knows me and I know him and I know how he works. I know, uh, he, he can say, okay, you're, you're singing a little sharp. Okay. Take, take one headphone off, move it off. To ah, okay. Bit. And I go, okay. And I take one headphone off. And so I can kind of hear myself through that same side ear. And, and that fixes it. Then I'm not singing sharp anymore. Wow. And uh, and he knows when you know when I'll have some kind of quirk in my voice, like a yodel or something. Yeah. You know, that he likes. He'll say, "Oh, well, keep that, keep that." And then you know, and we'll do. You know, he'll we'll go through, and uh, we'll 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 go through singing the track, and you know, if I fuck up really bad. Or forget the words, or, or or misspeak, or do some. We'll stop, and we'll go back, and we'll re, re, you know we'll continue. And what? We'll, and usually we'll we'll try to get like four or five takes that sound pretty good, mm -hmm. and uh, and then we'll combine. You know, then he'll sit oh, with okay. me and the engineer guy, and we'll go line by line, word by word, sometimes. You know, and go, okay, take word, you know, this word from track one, mm -hmm. this next word from track three, this next word back to track one, this next word back to track three. And and you can edit that precisely, you know, with, with Pro Tools. That's amazing. And, and then we'll combine the tracks into one track that, has, that may have, you know, three or four different takes all put together yeah. into one, but... You can't tell. You can't. You can't see the edits. Yeah. You can't hear the edits because if you have a really good guy, and then and that's important too. You have to. You have to be in there with an engineer that you really trust and you know is good and not only good but but fast. You know that he can do it. And that he blaze right through it and he puts it all together and and uh, and then you know. Uh, so, I mean, so that's, that's, that's the way we do it. And then, and then if, if after all of that, you know, go through the whole thing, if, if there's one word or one line that none of the four tracks makes it, you know, works for it, he'll go, okay, well, you got to go back in. Yeah. You got to go back in and sing this line, just sing this line, or just sing that line, or just sing that word. And, uh, <clears throat> and so that's, I think a lot of it is, is just confidence in each other that, that he knows, I know that, that I know, I trust his judgment and his ear and he trusts what I can do also vocally. He won't ask me to do something that he knows I can't do. Yeah. And, uh, so it's just, you know, it's just years of years of yeah. doing that, years of working together and. Uh, you know, I used to do, uh, on most of his records, I came in to do background vocals, usually on songs that I wrote the lyrics to Okay. on, on his records, you know, way back since 1989. So we, we've got a, a, a history there. So I'm curious, you know, and, um, you guys wrote, uh, Edge of a Broken Heart for Vixen. That's right. And I remember, so this is going way back, I remember um, shortly after, I, or not shortly after, but after an interview with you, and you saying that you had another song for him, but they choose they chose not to take that song 
Do you remember what that right. song was? No. Oh, okay. I was just curious no. because it was funny because I, I remember you saying in that interview, you said, well, we know how many hits they had. They had that one song that we wrote. <laughs> Right. Well, that's what happened. They Richard produced that first record. They had a number one song with "Edge of a Broken Heart," uh -huh. and uh, uh, and then you know they 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 thought, "Oh, we're great. We can do it. We don't need you." And so when the next record came around. They said, "No, we don't need you. Sorry, Richard. We don't need you." And Richard said, "Well, we you know we had this we had this next single all ready for you. And like, no thanks. It's okay." <laughs> And so they they dumped him and they dumped our song, and that was pretty much the end of Vixen. It was. It was. Yeah, that was it. Well, Fee, I so. appreciate your time, and it's been amazing talking to you. And everybody, go pick up Fee Wable Rides again because it's a great album. Yeah, you can you can find it at uh, my website feewable dot com or at the Tubes website. They have, it's there or any of the digital you know, Amazon or iTunes or any of that kind of digital stuff. Nice. Uh, it's, it's all there, but, but, uh, thank you for having yeah. me. I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll okay. chat. We'll chat soon. <laughs>